you very much, Professor Korshalak, for the introduction. As I've been introduced, my name is Paul Bennyworth, and I work at the Centre for Higher Education Policy Studies at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And having looked at the programme, I thought what it would be appropriate to do with my presentation today is to, is to take the conference perhaps on a final, more practical wending towards considering the policy dimensions of universities and regional engagements, and really to try and stimulate a discussion around how you effective university region cooperation can be managed more effectively and ensure that universities and regions are working together well around the creation of knowledge and innovation. I'm going to present work, some work I've been undertaking over the last few years and the many people have been involved in that and I'd like to acknowledge their support. I'd also like to thank Agnieszka and Gregor for inviting me to speak to you today. So many thanks uh, to all of those who've made this possible today. And Agnieszka. Yes, and Agnieszka. Paul <laughs> So my idea of today is what I want to do to, to create a, a theoretical framework for understanding it is to take a strategic management perspective on the practicalities that exist when you are trying to implement urban science projects. My argument, I don't think, is contentious. We've heard it in many presentations today. And that's urban science projects, they must be managed in ways that reflect the interests and desires of all the stakeholders <coughs> at every stage of the project. So, I'm going to frame this in terms of a a set of a concepts around strategic management. And the background to this is the, the widespread acceptance that there has been a change in the way that the business of government takes place. Away from a kind of management in hierarchies from the top down, towards unleashing the dynamic potential of the public sector by encouraging competition in markets for public services. But of course when you have competition you need to ensure that the public sector retains the capacity to coordinate activities. So the, the thinking behind strategic management is in ensuring that there is a solid framework for cooperation between a set of partners who may be individually competing and hence delivering efficiency in the use of public resources. Now we've seen this for both uh, local authorities and universities. Local authorities have seen a strategic role emerging around identifying new growth opportunities, identifying global challenges to their welfare, and mobilizing partnerships to respond to those challenges. Universities have seen a new strategic management agenda to identify how they can compete globally for talent and resources for research, and ensure that the university works as one to compete effectively and deliver public goals. So what we then see in terms of how universities and regions work together, and John Goddard should take, this is his model, and he's been talking about this now for a decade, and that really the idea about the strategic management of regional engagement is that what is needed to coordinate universities and regions working together effectively is a strategic interface, a, a conceptual policy space where universities and regions can come together and identify what resources they have, what challenges they face, and ways that they can manage those resources and developments effectively to create mutual benefit, strengthening the university in its search for global talent, strengthening the city in its <coughs> quest for global economic success. Now, that's the, the, the strategic management idea about universities and regions. So the specific problem domain we're dealing today is with what I characterise as urban science. In the context of the knowledge economy, both universities and cities are what we might think of as knowledge places. They are places where people come to exchange knowledge, be creative, and create wealth, quality of life, and ultimately to, to live. And so it seems natural it seems intuitive that we should try and manage the city and the university constructively to ensure that the, the knowledge workers, the knowledge people that come to these places are, are interacting constructively to create mutual benefit. So when I talk about urban science today, what I'm talking about is a management domain of attempting to create strategic projects in cities involving universities that increase the attractiveness 
of those cities and universities in the eyes of the outside world. Now, it's important to realize that the, the strategic management approach contains a series of identified weaknesses. It is a good way of understanding what happens, but you have to understand its limitations. And the principal limitation is that there is a tendency for happy families approaches. Because ultimately, achieving cooperation within regions is very difficult to achieve. You're attempting to achieve consensus about both abstract goals and visions for the future, but also very concrete questions about the allocation of resources, and the, the who gets to consume what in contemporary society, that are really at the nub of what the whole domain of politics is about. And because you have to achieve consensus, and because different partners in an urban science coalition might have a different vision of what they want to achieve. They might regard the region as being something different. A firm may see a region as being a source of highly skilled workers. To a local authority, the region might be a place where voters support their political parties, support their, their action plans. And if there, are, if there are changes in those interests, then the consensus can easily fall apart. So I would say the big strategic challenge for urban science is finding a way to hold diverse partners with diverse interests together. And this, is, this table just sets out a few of those partners and a couple of interests that these partners might have in cooperating strategically. Now, from this table, it doesn't make a claim to comprehensiveness. But the key point is that there are many kinds of stakeholders involved. And we also see that stakeholders aren't um, homogenous groups. Even firms, you see a difference between what real estate firms want which is a stable, buoyant property market, and what high-tech firms want, which is accessing the kinds of the knowledge that can help them to innovate and ultimately compete successfully. So all I'm saying here is that the strategic management problem of urban science is not a trivial one. And I would, my argument in this presentation is that it must be taken as non-trivially by all policymakers if you really to be effectively solved. What I want to do now is give a set of tools by which you can think through the problems as policymakers in order to come up with better solutions. So what we can see is that any urban science, poli any urban science policy that succeeds is effectively it's going to be a set of concrete proposals that meets partners' interests effectively. So the, uh, the, what emerges will ultimately be something that satisfies uh, uh, the broadest cross-section of the, co the innovation coalition. And I don't think that's controversial to say. What I do want to point out, though, is that we see, even thinking about universities' interests in urban science, we start to see that the same stakeholder can have multiple interests. And we've heard many presentations in the course of these two days where universities, on the one hand, have a set of public interests. They want to be seen and appreciated and funded as good public citizens that deliver public benefits. But at the same time, in this new age of public management, they have to have the resources to compete effectively. And that means that in urban science projects, they clearly have a set of private interests in maximizing the resources they can access. So what does this mean in practice for a project? This divergence of interests can create unexpected problems that lead apparently plausible projects to fail. So as partners' interests change, or if partners' interests diverge, then you might see that what everyone can agree in the abstract is a good idea is failed to be delivered. So in order to illustrate this, I've got a hypothetical example for you. And the, the idea is that this is a region that's developed an innovation strategy. And central to that is creating a new science park around the university that's going to create 2,000 jobs. Everyone can agree that this is a positive thing for the region. But then suddenly, when they look at the site that they've chosen for the science park, it becomes clear that for environmental reasons, for transport reasons, actually locating the park there becomes almost impossible. So unless a solution is found to this very practical planning problem, then everyone stands to lose from the, the failure to deliver the science park. And that's a particular example of something that we know more generally from two decades of regional innovation studies. What we know is that regional innovation projects typically go through a, a, a cycle of enthusiasm and exhaustion and disappointment. 
Regional innovation strategies, they, they go through different cycles, and at the end of those cycles, the partners have to work so hard to deliver something, there is the risk that if partners cannot agree new sets of aims, that they drift away and fail to deliver on the good intentions. So that the four aim, the four stages are typically that a strategy has to be written. The second is that priorities have to be set. Thirdly, resources have to be assembled to deliver those priorities. And then finally, the resources have to be spent in particular places to achieve changes. And at each time, achieving those outcomes in a diverse direction is a real effort. And that effort can sometimes lead to a sense of exhaustion when those are finished. So what you have to ensure, what we know from two decades of assessments of regional innovation strategies, is that from the very start you have to identify a series of successes that partners can draw upon that arise from the good times that will see them through the bad times and ultimately come to a point where everyone appreciates the value of regional innovation strategies. So the hypothetical example I gave before was a clear example of a failure between the resource assembly and the project delivery. Now what I'd say is that the point about the different stages is that partners have very different interests at different stages of the project. So in the hypothetical example, the local authority really only becomes concerned with the planning issues at the very end. Until it knows how many jobs and how much waste is to be collected, it can't really meaningfully object or shape the proposals. And my contention is that effective urban science and coming from good intentions to good delivery requires creating projects that both move forward, in which coalitions stay together, but that are capable of meeting partners' interests in, so it, throughout the lifetime of the project to keep the coalitions together. And so the question then becomes, how can you hold those interests together? And I think the first step is that you have to understand the breadth of those interests. So I hope that you can read this slide, but what we can see is that the actors who are typically involved in urban science coalitions, they have a wide mix of interests, a single actor, has public and private interests, has short-term and long-term interests. Now, partners latently want to achieve all those interests. But at particular points, some of those interests will be more important to them than others. So that what, what you see is that effective urban science projects are the ones that progress in ways that meet the interests that are most salient to the, to the coalition at that particular point in time. And my contention is that what you have to do with projects is to ensure that there is a high degree of what I call strategic coupling. And so that what you do is you create projects that naturally hold partners together, allow them to mutually meet their interests as the projects evolve and allow the projects to evolve over time. Now, I appreciate that for a concluding session, that's quite a, an abstract formulation. So what I really want to do in the time I have available, which is... Just another 10 minutes. Fantastic. Safe. Is to present a concrete example. Let's make it six. And the concrete example that I want to present is the case of the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And in, in particular, an urban science project called Kennis Park, which is Dutch for Knowledge Park. But it emerged at a time in the late 1990s when England, English hadn't really quite become the lingua franca. So it's still called Kennis Park. Now, it's an interesting example because the university has strong <coughs> regional roots and it has felt those roots in good times and bad because it was created in the 1960s to try and revive a declining textiles industry. The industry went into crisis and disappeared in the 1970s and the university almost disappeared and there were calls in parliament for the funding to be spent elsewhere. And in response to that, the university tried to reinvent itself as an entrepreneurial regional university to demonstrate its public value by supporting the economic conversion of the region. And it became very actively involved in the early 1980s in things that we've only just started really talking about around spin-off companies, around incubators, science parks, uh, knowledge networks. And this, the university put so much effort into them and was so successful that there was a, a kind of golden decade in which everything went well. And towards the end of the 1990s, the university and the region 
the province, started to ask the question, well, where do we go from now? We cannot afford to be complacent in our planning. And they, they, they saw the next step in the journey as creating a new knowledge district. So the region of Twente, although it, was, it, it, it had gone through a textiles reconversion, it was still a comparatively poor Dutch region, but with this island of excellence of high-tech companies located around the university. And the idea was, wouldn't it be great if we could magnify this, the, this, uh, this archipelago of high-tech to the region as a whole? If we could somehow bring the university and business closer together to create a new urban knowledge district. And this is the, the concept that we see emerging in the, 19, the late 1990s. The idea, this is the, the, physical, this is the physical layout. The, uh, the, the red line is the Hengelose Straat, the, linking the two towns and the conurbation. To the north of that lies the university campus, to the south of it is the business and science park. And about five kilometres in either direction there is a town. To the north there is Hengelo, to the south there is Enschede. And the idea was that this agglomeration, the campus and business and science park, could become a new knowledge space for the region of Twente, to make Twente a knowledge region. Bringing business onto the campus, bringing the university onto the business and science park, and symbolically unifying the space by eliminating <coughs> the motorway that separated them. And for four years, although everyone agreed this was a good idea, there was no concrete action to move the plan forward. What is interesting is that it took a series of crises to really push the plan forward. And it was hit by three separate crises in which the plan evolved, and evolved in what, with the benefit of hindsight, we know to be very positive directions. So in the early 2000s, there was a set of real economic problems. There was a high-tech bur bubble burst, and a number of R&D companies in the region closed, taking over a 1,000 employment positions with them. The university had its entire campus condemned by the mayor because it was 40 years old and built of concrete and a building went on fire and they had to find 200 million euros to rebuild the campus. And the government, local government, faced a legitimacy crisis because the defence ministry closed a local air base that employed about 2,000 people. So suddenly all three parts of the triple helix were facing pressure. And that, was a, that stimulated a response in the way the Kent Park project emerged. The second crisis came when a plan was agreed upon. And they said the Knowledge Park, Kent Park, will become a regional flagship. But then all the rural municipalities said, well, why should we, rural new municipalities, play for, pay for a new urban knowledge district? So, a reasonable question to ask. And then in the late 2000s, there was a third crisis when they actually had to get down to the practicalities of delivering the knowledge park. And removing a motorway <coughs> in an urban system, certainly in the Netherlands, is a lot more complicated than it's, it seems. And both Hengelo and Enschede were concerned about the effect that this would have on travel times. And there was a risk that, a, there was a risk that the university <coughs> would withdraw from the project if the motorway was not removed. And these three crises stimulated what we now can see to be very positive developments in the nature of the Kennis Park project. At each stage, it evolved through the crisis by taking into account actors', actors interests. What this map does, these, these maps are the, the two dimensions, short term, long term, opportunistic um, public benefits that were set in the, the, the conceptual framework I set out earlier. And what that shows is how the, the Kennis Park project evolved over the, four, over the four periods of its life cycle. So with the early crises, Kennis Park the, the partners decided that it was going to be a regional flagship. It was a, something symbolic that would save the region. Everyone could agree that this was important. In the second stage, there was an agreement that, of course, there had to be clear rural benefits for the rural municipalities for this urban knowledge district. So a lot of effort was put into thinking how you could have rural hubs that could benefit from the central knowledge park location and make sure that particularly businesses in these rural districts benefited from the knowledge that existed. And then in the third stage, what it took, there was an incredibly intensive lobbying effort of the two local municipalities really saying, you know, if you break up university region cooperation for the sake of a motorway, understand what you are throwing away. And in the end, the councillors, both councillors, Hengelo and Enschede, agreed to remove the motorway. And that was the symbolic act of 
breaking down the barriers between business and university by physically removing the barrier between them. And that leads, that's where Kenneth Park is today. It's, a, it's an emerging as the property crisis. But I, I think what is an interesting example is not because it's a best practice that people should follow. I think it's interesting practice because it shows the nature of the way the happy families problem plays out. It's a high stakes game. You're playing for hundreds of millions of euros and of course there will be tensions. But if you don't play the game by acknowledging those tensions, then you are putting yourself at a strategic disadvantage. So really, there are three general lessons that I would make in the context of this session that people can take away from Kent's part. And the first is that it is important not to underestimate the problems and tensions that arise in urban science. <coughs> there are clear win-wins in universities and cities working together. But to get to the, to the promised land of that cooperation, you'll sometimes have to trudge through a desert of torturous negotiations. And it is important to be clear about the difficulties that might arise in order that all parties are equipped <coughs> to deal with them when they do arise. Now this brings us to the second point, and that is that because it's a win-win situation, is that it's important at every stage to prove the benefits and fight and show off the benefits to make continually the broader case for what you are trying to achieve. And this brings me to my third point, which is that that has to be done in a very concrete way. There are some actors who really don't have abstract interests. If you are a property company, you simply want to rent out units to high-tech business. <coughs> you will not be convinced by a, a big story, a, a convincing narrative of, of regional change. You want to see that regional change in concrete. And this brings us to the final point. It is that it is important to continually come up with demonstrators that show the complex ideas for those cooperations in tangible ways that bring the <coughs> benefits for all concerned. And of course, it always helps if you can get a, a very important person, in this case, our <coughs> Minister President, Mark Rutter, to come and praise the idea to representatives of the Triple Helix. This is from a visit earlier in the year where he spoke to the local government, he spoke to the university, and he spoke to business life and said that in the region of Twente they had to realise how special what they were doing was. And something like this, it is, it is important not to underestimate how much university regional cooperation can be helped by achieving positive support from outside partners who appreciate what you are trying to do. Because what it ultimately tells you is what we've been arguing about in the abstract today that universities and cities working together is something valuable and it is something to be valued. And ultimately, it's worth all the effort and negotiation that's required to secure a successful place for both the university and the, and the region in the global knowledge economy. If you want to read any more about the theory or the example, there's a paper just been published in Built Environment, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you.